Greetings, Aquaba. Welcome to the 45th annual National Council for Black Studies virtual conference from Western Massachusetts, where I am, from the deep South Black Belt, Alabama, where our conference chair, Alfonso Simpson, is, from Metro Atlanta, where our membership chair, Dr. Alicia Fontenet, and from around the world. We greet you, we welcome you, and I turn the gavel over to Dr. Siri McDougall to take us into this fantastic plenary that activates and engages one of the core principles of our credo, academic excellence, social responsibility, cultural grounding. And on that very first one, we're going to be diving deep today. Thank you for joining us. We do have, uh, just for uh, purposes of communicating, there is a chat function and several of us will be in the background monitoring that. And so at this point, I turn you over to the chair of this session to uh, begin this wonderful plenary. Asante Sana, peace and blessings. Thank you, thank you very much for that. And echoing President Shabazz, welcome to this panel on academic excellence, more specifically the future of academic excellence. We have several um, brilliant panelists today. Um, Dr. Karanja Carroll, I'm going to introduce everybody and then we'll go into the presentations and say, and we'll have a question and answer after everyone has presented. But first, Dr. Um, Dr. Karanja Carroll, who teaches at Baruch College, um, is an independent scholar. He's uh, an African centered theoretician with emphasis on social and psychological theory. And he places an emphasis on scholarship that's grounded in the creation and utilization of culturally specific frameworks in order to understand and create solutions for humanity. Ever since I've known him, he has always taken his knowledge outside of the walls of the university and um, taught classes in various places uh, and including uh, correctional facilities. Dr. Dr. Carroll is committed to academic excellence and social responsibility. Um, as, as in his in work, as originally articulated by the National Council of Black Studies. Um, Dr. Carroll is uh, one of the first people who I've encountered um, who talked about the discipline of Africana studies as a discipline. So much so at, at Temple, it's just referred to as the discipline. Um, and those conversations will forever have shaped my uh, my own intellectual thoughts. So this is a big brother, always be a big brother in the discipline to me. So very excited to hear him speak today. Um, Dr. Marquita Gamage, professor of Africana Studies at Cal State University Northridge, the author of two important books. She's also become one of the most significant Afrocentric intellectuals in the contemporary moment. And even that is an understatement. Her research interests focus on <clears throat> overt and covert representations of racism and sexism as they pertain to media generated images of black womanhood. And among her books is the popular representations of black women in the media, the damnation of black womanhood. Um, and Dr. Gamage is already a, a, a leader, but I mean, very much poised to become uh, an institutional leader in this discipline. Uh, I'm certain of that. Just is certain to happen. And as as well, is the same is true for Dr. Justin Gamage, um, who has submitted a, a traditionally short bio. Uh, Dr. Gamage always has, even though he could say far more, but. Uh, Dr. Gamage Reese is, is a professor in the Department of Africana Studies at Cal State University, Dominguez Hills, and his research interests are African-American political economy with a focus on the history of social movements past and present um, that address the factors challenging the social, political, and economic security of people of African descent. In addition, his research explores 
models of economic development in African American communities. Dr. Gamage is a great mentor and has introduced many scholars to the discipline who've gone on to advance the discipline. And whenever he writes an article, it is it's 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 always on something that very few people have written about. So um, definitely uh, is going to be a great presentation from Dr. Gamage. And Suresh Jawartna, um, who teaches in Africana Studies at San Diego State University. Her research is focused on the African diaspora in the Western Indian Ocean, specifically South Asian states like India and Sri Lanka. And Dr. Gerardin's research is culturally grounded and considered through the lenses of Africana epistemologies, Black geographies, Africana aesthetic, Black visual culture and scholarship, <clears throat> racial, forma <clears throat> racial formation and coloniality, and South Asian socialities. Her broader research interests include African diaspora theory, global iterations of Black power politics, Africana womanism, and African diasporic spirituality. One of the emerging scholars in the discipline, um, innovating, adding new tools and lenses to the discipline, she is uh, pushing the boundaries and expanding the scope of our great discipline. And uh, just a just a, a fan of everybody on this panel. So every time each one of them has written something, I immediately am I'm going to read it. And I'm very excited to like a graduate student right now um, and honored to be in the presence of, of the people on this panel in particular. Uh, so I'm very excited. And I am uh, Siri McDougall, Professor of Pan-African Studies at Cal State University, Los Angeles. And again, this panel is the future of academic excellence in Black studies. The panel, of, cor of course, is gonna explore this idea, this, this core component of the mission of our discipline. The presenters, the presenters are gonna explain different ways that the discipline can advance the knowledge, skills, and the ideas most needed to advance Black communities in the discipline it, and the discipline itself. Uh, particular attention will be given to describing how the academic excellence can be enhanced and perpetuated in the future of our discipline. And we will start with Dr. Sureshi Jawardana. All right, um, am I able to share my screen? Yes, should be. Um, I'm gonna ask that you um, excuse the intermittent screaming of my 16 month old in the background. She's having a hard time being away from me um, for too long. <laughs> Uh, but thank you, Dr. McDougall, for inviting me to participate in this plenary, and um, it's an honor to be um, on a panel with um, esteemed colleagues like um, Dr. Mark Vita Gamage, Dr. Justin Gamage, and Dr. Carol. Um, what I'm presenting today is an extension of research that I presented at NCBS last year. Today's presentation sheds light on how an emerging subfield such as Africana Digital Humanities, or DH for short, opens up new possibilities for developments in both how we do research and how we teach. My contention is based on experimental research conducted at a large public university in California, where Africana DH concepts, theories, and tools were integrated into an upper division um, Africana Studies course on the Black urban experience. In this course, students were exposed to digital humanities discourse, concepts, and existing Africana DH projects that showcase various dimensions of the Black experience. For their final project, students were asked to combine research, narrative, mapping, and digital media to highlight a Black urban experience of their choosing. So let me start with some context. 
Um, the way that I approach Africana studies is to think of it as a meta discipline that has several subfields or areas of specialty. Um, and these include psychology, political science, religion, literature, sociology, and so forth. And so to me, um, digital humanities is just another subfield, but one that has not been fully developed yet. Um, Africana DH is unique in that it prioritizes science, computing, and the digital. Um, and this has been the case since Nathan Hare conceived of the original Black Studies curriculum in the 1960s. Um, he envisioned science and technology as a track, much like um, a humanities and social science um, tracks, and even listed Black science among the core courses for the discipline. Since then, there have been a handful of publications about digital humanities questions and content related specifically to Africana studies. Um, and by this, what I mean is scholarship that actually engages these quest questions of the digital and of science, specifically from within the discipline of Africana studies. Um, and what you see on this slide are some of these publications um, that already embrace the role of science and tech as constitutive elements of the discipline, um, considering questions of black liberation through a humanities computing lens and building knowledge, new knowledge through the application of digital humanities tools. Um, and given kind of the, the political and public health context that we are currently in, Africana DH is especially relevant today. Um, on the one hand, our classes are filled with students who are extremely tech savvy. Um, and on the other hand, we need to acknowledge their breadth of tech knowledge, um, that they're not mere users of digital platforms and tools, but active participants and curators within technology, um, technologically derived spaces, environments, and conversations. Um, our current circumstance, as I alluded to, also offers us a unique opportunity to contemplate the pedagogical dimensions of Africana studies as we navigate an almost exclusively remote teaching experience um, due to the pandemic. Um, there is a resource, and I'm just going to pause this here to show you the resource. Um, there is a resource that the Digital Humanities Center at San Diego State. Um, can you see this? At San Diego State. Um, yes, can see. Thank you. Um, put together last summer to help faculty modify teaching practices for the online environment. Okay, now I have a, oh, there's only 58 participants today. I see what you mean. Okay, so we don't want to stop video. And within the tools section, um, or where is it to um, the tools section? You'll find um, resources that highlight some of the things that I have used in um, this particular um, Africana DH class, but also in other classes that help um, help us think about how to teach Africana studies. Um, through a virtual modality. Let me go back to my slides now. Um, so that's the link up there if you are interested in um, taking a look at what those resources might look like. Um, um, as part of the experiment that I conducted with this class, um, turning it into a digital humanities class, part of that exercise also required that I look at how to teach digital humanities content. Um, and so I turned to scholarship on pedagogy in Africana studies um, because I wanted to maintain um, cultural relevance, both in the types of material and content I was assigning to the class, but also in my instructional practice. Um, and I actively wanted to resist looking to the fairly sizable body of research 
about digi digital pedagogy within digital humanities as a more um, broader and more Eurocentric field. Um, and so I looked to Africana pedagogy. And this is something that I realized was distinct from what we know as African-centered or Afrocentric pedagogy, which is more focused on the K through 12 context. And while this type of centeredness, this type of cultural relevance um, is important to Africana studies and certainly applies here, um, if we look closely, we see that culturally relevant pedagogy is not a dimension of our discipline that has been thoughtfully developed. Um, there has been a good amount of focus on integrating the threefold mission of Africana studies, so academic excellence, cultural relevance, and social responsibility, um, well into the standardized curriculum at both graduate and undergraduate levels, as well as in departmental and programmatic definitions and philosophies. Um, and you also find this very easily across the research as well, in terms of developing theories, models, concepts, and methods methodologies. However, there hasn't been much attention to how Africana Studies faculty should teach the content areas of the discipline. Um, and to use my colleague Dr. Carroll's words, uh, we need to have a focus on the manner in which information about the Africana experience is transferred to students. So in looking at the literature about pedagogy within Africana Studies itself, there's just kind of a handful of um, uh, uh, pieces of literature. And so um, you start to see um, in this slide here, there's a few things that I highlight. The Kufundisha model, which is um, based on a Swahili term, which means to teach. Um, there's this idea of revolutionary education. Um, there's a general commitment to um, teaching as a practice of liberation. Uh, and most recently, J.T. Rohn um, wrote in Black Perspectives, which is an online blog of the um, African-American Intellectual Society about deep study, um, which we can connect to um, ideas of African deep thought as well. So in embarking on this experiment, a big question that relates to the discipline as a whole, I found was, um, what pedagogical priorities do we set and what training do we offer for the effective teaching of Africana studies? Um, and so basically a sub question of that is what might an Africana DH class teach us about teaching um, that can be sort of expanded to the whole discipline. So what I'll show you next is a sense of how I structured this class. Um, and then I'll share with you what I discovered about pedagogy um, and the effective and su successful um, execution of student projects. Um, so the structure of the course, um, there, were, um, there were things students had to do over the 16 week semester. Uh, one of the things that they did related to like weekly readings was um, reflection essays. But this big sort of final project um, was called a story maps project using um, a mapping tool, a digital humanities mapping tool called Story Maps through um, ArcGIS. Um, it's sort of the more lay version of GIS mapping technology. And this project, I kind of broke it up into smaller chunks to make it manageable, to make it less threatening or intimidating because many students who start the class are often just sort of anxious about um, the details of the project because it's so tech technologically driven and um, some students sort of fear being able to complete it or do well with this project. Um, so it starts off in the first couple of weeks where students, um, students pick a city with um, sort of a significant um, or sort of a known story about black contributions to that city. Um, a few weeks later, they turn in an annotated bibliography, which um, uh, provides them an opportunity to look into the scholarship about that city, about the black contributions to that city, and then to write about how they will use each of those sources in their project, how that source fits into the larger narrative that they're constructing for the project. Um, a few weeks later, they get um, in-house sort of um, demonstration of how to use the story maps tool. Um, I also set up um, 
small group consultations with an expert on the story maps tool from the Department of Geography, as well as folks in the Digital Humanities Center at San Diego State to provide sort of ongoing technical support um, and help troubleshoot things. Uh, I then also discovered that it was important to create time during the class, um, during the semester in class, where students were able to work on their projects and that they didn't have to rely on time entirely outside of class to work on the project. Um, one of the cool things about the Digital Humanities Center at San Diego State is that they have several MacBooks that you can um, loan out just for a class time or a day. Um, and so even if you don't have access to a reliable computer um, and Wi-Fi access, it's something that you can use at the DH Center. So that became a resource as well during these work days. Um, the work days also allowed students to be able to show me kind of works in progress, um, see how they could sort of enhance or improve content, um, think about things visually, but also the visualization of the data and the narrative that they were presenting. Um, what they did as far as a finalized story map was to integrate any and all feedback um, and then send me a link to the final project. Um, and then they did an exhibit where, again, we use the Digital Humanities Center, which has many sort of 60 inch um, screens. And so each student was able to have their own computer and screen and showcase their project um, and have faculty in the department, other students, faculty outside of the department kind of visit and ask them questions about their projects. Um, and finally, they had to turn in a self-evaluation of the project experience. And for me, this was a really key component of um, the structure of this assignment simply because it gave me information for how to tweak and change um, the requirements um, and how I uh, function as an instructor, both in terms of the course content, but also in terms of this assignment throughout the semester. Um, so they answered things like how much support was received, um, if they understood and met all expectations, how they worked on the project, how many hours it took, um, and what new information was gained. Um, the majority of students who have taken this class with me and it's gotten more and more popular as more students have taken the class um, over the years um, is that they start off kind of um, nervous about it, anxious about the project, but then at the end of it, they end up kind of getting super creative and just carried away even with some of the features of the tool that then leads them to create these very dynamic projects. Um, and I think I wanna show you just, an, just one quick example of this project, of a student project, just so you have a sense of what it looks like when it's complete. Okay, so this one is called, um, I mean, the student didn't get very creative with the title, so it's called Black Detroit, FRS 421. Um, and as you can see, there's this narrative component and there's um, the digital media uh, side to it as well. Um, and you scroll down this way, um, you can see they've inserted sort of um, sources for imagery. Um, there's also footnotes for um, what is at the very end um, a bibliography. Um, as you can see, there's a map here that is a picture of a map that's been uploaded to the tool. But when we go further along here, you will see that this student also created a map using the tool. Um, and we're getting to that in just a couple slides. So right here, um, again, they uploaded this map of the city of Detroit, um, the post-war improvement program. And then to the right here is a map with these green dots that the student created. And the green dots show, um, the black population of Detroit in 2019, or the median income for um, house, median household income for the black population in 2019. And then the shades of brown um, show the black population um, relative to the total population, um, the concentration of the black population in different parts of Detroit. So this ended up being sort of 
a very interesting, unique way to have students think about Black people in urban spaces, um, Black history, um, while also gaining some technical skills. Um, and so I just thought it was an interesting way to kind of get students to consider the Black urban experience and our relationship to space and placemaking. Let me just go back to my slides here. Um, so, um, the main sort of takeaways from this experiment is that um, I think this, this DH class um, has been instructive for how to teach digital humanities just within Africana studies courses. But given what, um, given the context that we're currently in uh, and what the pandemic has forced upon us as instructors and educators and scholars, I think these kind of ideas, these takeaways apply to a broader Africana studies pedagogical model. Um, and so I think it's um, important to kind of consider these things as we, as we navigate this very virtual teaching space right now. Um, one of the things that um, I discovered was that it was really important to make explicit how all course related activities, whether they were sort of just paired short activities in the classroom while, during class, um, short assignments or things that folks had to do prior to coming to class or once class was done. Um, it was important to connect those very explicitly to the student learning outcomes or the course objectives because that motivated students to want to kind of um, complete those things if they could see what they actually accomplished. Um, um, facilitating deep study. So really sort of showing students how to engage in deep study. Um, I start off the semester by providing them some um, guidelines on how to read critically, um, how to like what things to look for in the readings um, and how to be able to sort of synthesize readings in a way that they're not just highlighting every single page of a reading or just kind of um, just noting down every single sentence, but really kind of thinking about ideas and arguments that are presented in readings. Um, so critical reading and critical thinking skills was a helpful tool, excuse me. Um, a third thing was to build into the initial weeks of the um, class, and this is about the first three to four weeks, um, what I call toolbox weeks, because they're really the time when I spend um, talking to students about theories, concepts, just sort of the frameworks for analyzing and interpreting everything that's gonna come at us in the following weeks. Um, so some things I assign in this class are um, applied Africana studies written by Dr. McDougall and um, um, Dr. Tillotson. Um, there's a worldview article and I'm I'm blanking out on the full title, Dr. Carroll, but you wrote this about worldview in um, um, Africana sociology. Um, and so I assigned that article um, and just some other things to get them sort of thinking about how to approach the material. Um, and this has been helpful for students, both in terms of this project, but also as far as um, the course in general. Uh, another thing is to sort of offer consistent and ongoing feedback and support. Um, this was sort of important for this particular class prior to the pandemic, but I'm teaching three classes a semester and those are becoming, these skills are becoming ever more important um, in, the, in the virtual modality right now. Um, and to scaffold assignments where even if you have a big assignment that's due at the very end of the semester to find ways to break it up throughout the semester and offer feedback so that students are able to sort of manage those things um, along the way rather than waiting until the very end. Um, part of my motivation to break it up this way was also to make this assignment something that students wanted to do. Um, as an instructor, I find it really sort of disheartening when I have to read a research paper where you can 
tell that the student just didn't care or like they didn't, they had no real interest in what they were writing about. Um, and I want students to want to do the assignments. Um, and maybe that's a naive kind of desire, but <laughs> um, that's, that's kind of my goal. I want students to care about the assignments. Um, and just in closing here, um, I think at the 40th anniversary of the uh, the of Africana Studies, the Journal of Black Studies commemorated this anniversary by thinking about nomenclature and how the name we give ourselves reflects our reach, our relevance, um, the routes from which we come to be. Um, and I think that since we're at or just past the 50th anniversary of the discipline, I think it's really kind of important for us to go back to thinking about teaching and really, really be thoughtful um, and careful about how we craft um, a praxis um, uh, and ethics and models of teaching that are specific to Africana studies. Um, and with that, I think um, I will conclude there. Okay, thank you, Dr. Jawardna um, and Dr. Carroll. All right, Asante Sana, uh, Dr. McDougall, and fellow panelists for pulling this together. Um, it's good to be reconnected, though we are virtual. Um, I'm gonna be sharing some ideas around uh, teaching, pedagogy, and developing excellence in Africana studies. Um, being in Africana studies since my undergraduate years in the mid 1990s until today, one thing has been consistent as it relates to my commitment to the discipline and its advancement. This has fundamentally been what we do in our classrooms. Despite the conference presentations, papers published and public speaking events, what happens in the classroom determines the future of our discipline. This should be understood as a rationale for why we must continue to think through and seriously work on engage, excuse me, work on our pedagogical practice. Foundational to my own pedagogical practice is the African worldview. The literature on the worldview framework is thorough for my own publications to the work of Azebo, Jameson, Maat, Dixon, Nichols, Nobles, Myers, and so on. We have all worked to center the worldview framework in our scholarship. And for me, I've used the worldview framework to center how I think about what is done in the classroom. As Kobe Cambone argues, our worldview system determines our definitions, our concepts, and our values, whether we consider events that we experience important, true, good, et cetera, or whether we attend to them at all. Thus we, must, thus we make assumptions about events that we experience based upon our predisposed values, beliefs, and attitudes. Towards the nature of things, these values, beliefs, and attitudes comprise an organized body of ideas or a conceptual framework for viewing, defining, and experiencing the nature and meaning of events that constitute our phenomenal reality and even determine what phenomenal reality will in fact be. <clears throat> Furthermore, as Gloria Joseph states, a conceptual system refers to those philosophical assumptions we use to define and structure reality. It is therefore basic to the way in which we perceive and interpret. It is the basis of our worldview. All people have a conceptual system usually shaped for the most part by the culture with which they identify. Thus one's worldview is essential to their very being in the basis of how they come to know, make sense of and engage their social reality. Clarity on worldview is extremely important. And the educator who forces their students to think critically is the most feared, but also the most successful in attempting to take students to the next level of analysis. As early as 1852, Martin Delaney understood that Africans, quote, have been taught to believe that we must have some person think for us instead of thinking for ourselves. So accustomed are we to submission in this kind of training, end quote. Delaney was clear on the role of, pe of a people thinking for themselves. Staying rooted within our worldview systems allows for us the basis of thinking for ourselves. Educational institutions must function to do this. Africana studies must function to do this as well. Questions around cosmology, ontology, axio and axiology should center how we look at our classes and requires us to think about what we're doing, why we're doing it, 
and how we are doing it. As I've reflected upon these core components of worldview, I have attempted to work around a series of worldview related questions. An understanding of cosmology suggests that the universe is interconnected and interrelated. As it relates to teaching and pedagogical practices, an African cosmology puts forth the question, how does an interwoven, interconnected and interrelated understanding of the universe impact notions of education, knowledge and wisdom? An African ontological understanding of reality suggests that all that is in existence is fundamentally energy. And even that which manifests as matter is at its origin energy. As this relates to teaching and pedagogical practices, an African ontology puts forth the question, how does energy, force and spirit work in the transmission of information? An African understanding of axiology <clears throat> suggests that the highest value is on interpersonal and intergroup relational functioning with a focus on unity. As it relates to teaching and pedagogical practices, an African axiology puts forth the question, how does the highest value placed upon the group and group functioning impact the transmission of knowledge and information? And finally, an African epistemological understanding of knowledge and knowledge acquisition suggests one gains knowledge and knows reality through that which can be acquired beyond the five senses and is a direct outgrowth of an African ontology, which posits the fundamental basis of all reality being spirit. As it relates to teaching and pedagogical practices, an African epistemology puts forth the question, how does the ability to grasp knowledge and information beyond the five senses impact the transmission of knowledge and the basic means by which an instructor can gauge the acquisition of knowledge with their students? Now, these questions brought about through the African worldview do not stand apart from one another. For this would be a contradiction of an African cosmology, which posits the interrelatedness of all things within the universe. Thus an understanding of the essential connectedness of the universe through spirit and energy warrants a priority on community. And it is this priority on community that can be pedagogical useful and unique within Africana studies classroom. It is the principle of the classroom as community that provides the foundational basis for the development of unique pedagogical practices within Africana studies. The classroom as community posits that instructors of Africana studies attempt to create, nurture, and cultivate communities within the physical spaces in which we teach. By community, I mean a collective unit in which each member is responsible to not only each other or just the instructor, but also to themselves. For instance, in my classes, I utilize a number of techniques to nurture community through circular, um, from circular seating arrangements, random peer reviews, uh, group-led debates, music analysis, and in-class oral exams. All of these techniques allow my students to know that they are just not accountable to me as the instructor, but they are accountable to their classmates. Because if the whole, if the whole class fails to work together as a unit, it will reflect negatively upon everyone in the class. I like to talk briefly about music analysis and in-class oral exams. I work to consistently include music and lyrical analysis into my classrooms. From the first day of the, the semester, I introduced my students to not only socially conscious music, but also the importance of critical analysis. At the start of each class, a song is played. After the song, I ask a series of questions, starting with what is the song about? Following with what are the lyrics that allows you to come to this conclusion about the purpose of the song? Now, this is a twofold process. For I'm concerned with having students listen closely to lyrics, making sure that they write down what they hear, but I'm also teaching them a skill set that will be useful when writing future papers. Arguably, if students are able to explain a song with evidence on how they reach those conclusions, when we move on to their written papers, they have the building, the basic building blocks on doing the same with essays. In addition, lyrical and musical analysis helps to nurture basic communication skills so that we're, we are a classroom of speakers and sharers rather than someone being just talked at. And this is important because if you can create an environment where our students are relaxed to talk about something as simple as a song, when we move into more complex literature, they are more relaxed and more open to sharing their interpretation, even if their interpretation might go against what others have stated within the classroom. Now, as it relates to in-class oral exams, 
This technique and approach has been useful in the development of community and support for those in the class. In some classes, I've chosen to give oral exams as a, <clears throat> as a portion of the midterm and the final exam. For the midterm, students are given a list of key terms and concepts prior to the exam. On the day of the exam, they randomly select one term and are required to explain the term as it relates to course content, letting us know authors, article, the specific articles, definitions, relevance of the course content, so forth and so on. This on the spot explanation of information is useful because this is the same type of engagement that they're potentially gonna deal with as they talk to others about what they've learned in class. And therefore you have this connection, you use the classroom as the means to practice explanation of ideas to folks beyond the classroom as it relates to community uh, partners, so forth and so on. Now, while the above um, mentioned techniques may be used um, within many Africana studies classrooms today, the point to be stressed here is that this current interpretation comes from a philosophical framework which posits that the classroom is a community. And members within the community must be functional contributors rather than passive observers and bystanders. Reliance upon the African worldview as a philosophical framework allows for such a basic explanation and has the potential to impact and provide a rationale <clears throat> for other practice among instructors of Africana studies. During our current teaching moment, which for many include, for, for many including myself, is remote, I have worked to utilize emotional uh, self-check-ins. Throughout the academic year, instructors can take out time to assess how their students are feeling. <clears throat> this is easily done on the first day of class, before and after an assignment, before and after an exam, after covering difficult course readings um, prior to class when an issue of a, socially impact, of a socially impactful event has taken place, et cetera. These check-ins are moments in which students can explore how they feel in general and or about the material and discussions, providing insight about their relationship to the task at hand. It further compare prepare students for upcoming activities. The goal therefore is to have students understand their feelings in a manner that is not flippant. The goal is for each student to become aware of the interconnected relationship of their emotional selves, their thinking selves, and their material selves, directing towards, directing their feelings and desires toward full development as critical thinkers. Since Africana studies is found at the undergraduate level, it is here where we must do most of the heavy lifting as it relates to introducing students to Africana studies and getting students invested in Africana studies. Therefore, we must always be conscious of teaching and pedagogical practice at this level. Our teaching is something that too many academics in higher education take for granted the Africana practitioner does not have that option, and she or he must consistently work to perfect the craft of teaching and education. Education, As we concern ourselves with not only what and why of Africana studies, but more importantly, the how, we must provide the foundation for commitment to a discipline for the next generation of Africana studies practitioners. Therefore, as those concerned with continued excellence in Africana studies, we must take it upon ourselves to seriously reflect upon what we are doing within the Africana Studies classroom. And I will stop right there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. Uh, are the doctors, Gamage, Dr. Gamage and Dr. Gamage? Yes, we're ready. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So good afternoon, good morning for those who are on the, on the West Coast. Uh, good afternoon for those who are uh, on the East Coast and other places around the world. Um, so our presentation will focus on high impact practices in Africana studies, uh, models for training future scholars. Essentially what our presentation stems from is a joint publication where we seek to begin the process of documenting what we're doing in our classrooms in Africana studies much what Dr. Carroll was discussing, uh, but essentially creating uh, uh, ongoing literature to document what we're doing and how effective those techniques are. And so with that, uh, much of what we are attempting to do is to highlight and identify effective methods in terms of engaging students, 
and trying to assess how that engagement leads to professional uh, development as well as uh, critical consciousness raising as well. So first we will start off uh, creating the historical foundations. Of course, uh, it's been stated already, but the historical foundations of the discipline of Africana studies is rooted and burst out of student protest. Um, and understanding that uh, we advocate for Africana studies to uh, remain student-centered in regards to its historical foundations. Um, as stated before by Dr. Carroll uh, as well, that the discipline itself is committed to a dual intellectual uh, uh, mission, which is intellectual engagement and social responsibility. Uh, which seeks to ground students in some form of excellence in terms of their production and their activity in the classroom, but also outside the classroom as it relates to them being active agents and change agents in the world. Um, and that leads them to their, their commitment in terms of social responsibility. The uh, two components in terms of linking the history with the future, uh, we're advocating that uh, in terms of moving forward, that our discipline understand that within the legacy of resistance, that Africana studies has to remain a discipline committed to challenging domination as it relates to African people throughout the world, right? And that this continuum of thinkers and activists uh, created the foundation for our field as it exists today, but it also must be centerpiece as it relates to us moving forward as it relates to graduate uh, engaging students. So when we think about the foundation of Africana studies and the future of it in academic excellence, we have to think about student-centeredness in Africana studies as a key component of um, our future. And student-centeredness, as we articulate, is cultivating an intellectual environment that utilizes pedagogical approaches that seek to activate the strength of students while grounding them in the histories, cultures, and worldview of Africana people. We point to several different illustrations of how this manifests itself. One of those things is an investment in the intellectual enrichment of students, in which I think you've heard quite a bit from our two first panelists sharing about that um, investment in intellectual enrichment and grounding in the cultures, the histories, and the, um, the worldview, and in the ideological um, understanding and philosophical, excuse me, philosophies of um, Africana people. Uh, the next point that we highlight is nurturing uh, critical consciousness as it relates to students. As we know, one of the foundational principles in terms of our discipline is uh, social responsibility. And with that, social responsibility is closely connected with critical consciousness. We are training our students to be active agents in the world and change agents in the world as well. And so when you nurture that critical consciousness, what will follow will be their advocacy for social change and social justice. Um, it will be their investment in their own communities. It will be their investment in speaking truth to power um, it will be their investment in, um, in their strength and their ability to um, decode and dissect the multifaceted realities that Africana people experience. And they can take that level of critical consciousness into every boardroom, every meeting, every uh, town hall, um, every community center in which they work, in which they collaborate, um, right back into their own dining room tables. They'll be able to take that critical consciousness with them wherever they go. And that's our job as, um, as um, practitioners of Africana studies to nurture students' critical consciousness. The next one is that we have to foster a collaborative learning environment, which I think um, Dr. Carroll has also just illustrated um, several illustrations and examples of that, of how we foster that collaborative learning environment. Um, yeah, so much of this is also understanding that learning is a two-way street, that it's not simply the responsibility of the instructor to endow information on the students themselves, but that the learning process is an exchange. And so that students have a responsibility within that exchange and to make sure that they understand that responsibility and they fulfill that commitment as well. Um, the next one is that we have to equip students with the tools for social change. It's not simply enough to raise their critical consciousness if they don't have the necessary tools to um, employ that critical consciousness. And so some of those tools are um, research skills, for instance, um, debate skills, oral speaking, right? When we think about it, um, organization skills, right? Being able to organize and collaborate with communities. So those collaborative skills as well. Um, and so those assignments like group assignments, group debates, um, 
as, as illustrations, um, group exams and quizzes um, as another illustration, those oral presentations, all of those are um, honing in on student skills so that they can have tools for social change. Um, and finally, uh, is a commitment to well-being of our students. Uh, we understand that our, our, our students are human beings and therefore we care about their well-being, whether that's their psychological well-being, physical well-being, but also their well-being within the educational process. Um, in Africana studies, it's often stated that we're more, just, we're more than just instructors that in many cases we're life coaches in which we take on uh, many of the challenges that our students are facing on the college campuses and sometimes even outside the campus. So we have to make sure that we are engaging in the well-being in our students in a holistic manner. Yeah, without the commitment to the well-being of our students, if they're not holding well as they enter into the classroom, then they're not going to receive any of the above points that we just mentioned. Um, it'll be more difficult for them to process those things if um, there are a whole other host of things that are on their plate and that we don't make space for. So we have to be committed and conscious to that commitment of making sure that um, we care more about the well, the overall and holistic well-being of our students, not just their intellectual development. We have a commitment to um, their overall well-being. And that leads us to what we want to talk about and how do we do this? And that's and when we talk about student centeredness in practice. So in, in regards to our article, we uh, highlighted high impact practices um, as it relates to being an effective me method in terms of engaging students. We define high impact practices in Africana studies as active learning methods that promote deep learning through student engagement. And some of these include student research engagement, intense um, and creative writing activities and publications. Uh, study abroad opportunities in which students can expand their knowledge base and also experience life in other places where African people live, as well as uh, conference presentations at professional conferences and other student conferences as well. And so that means at times creating those student conferences, as well as those publication opportunities at your home universities for students, um, and also fostering collaborative relationships with other local um, colleges in African studies departments. We in California, the, um, the CSU system have a lot of sister campuses uh, located in driving distance from each other. And so that fosters a great opportunity for us to be able to collaborate and have students learn from each other who are in close proximity. But also we uh, wanna encourage you that a high impact practice to take those students beyond their local communities um, and in order to expand their, um, their understanding of the lived realities of Africana people and they have a better chance of applying the critical thinking skills and critical knowledge that they're receiving. Service learning as well. As uh, as been stated in the past, uh, connecting the community to the campus and the campus to the community, making sure that we're grounding students within the context of social responsibility, but also creating the avenues to be able to know how to connect with the surrounding communities and the Black communities uh, that surround our campuses as well. And you can take these high impact practices into your extracurricular programming as well, especially when it gives students opportunities to um, develop their leadership skills and their organizational skills as well. They're going to take those skills back to their families and their communities and to their job um, industries that they go into as well. And so allowing them to actually participate in the planning of conferences, allowing them to participate in the editorial process of journals, um, the planning of programming. Um, there's a lot of programming that Africana Studies um, and Black Studies departments tend to do around Black History Month. Um, as an illustration that uh, um, employs students in those um, those arenas, not just literally like um, assign them as, for, as additional work, but we mean uh, pay them. <laughs> um, we know that students have real uh, responsibilities that they must take care of as well. So when we're in a position to be able to um, employ our students and pay them, and I think it's important that we take on those that responsibility as well um, so that they can fully participate in these types of opportunities. Um, and finally, uh, community engagement, which has already been echoed uh, but also in, in terms of community engagement, many times what we try to do is to make sure that the activities in the classroom connect with some uh, community, whether it's a local community or the communities in which they came from. The idea here is that students work should reflect their reality and that that work should uh, move toward transforming the communities that surround the campus as well as the communities that they're part of. And if you're looking for ways to kind of ground students with some of those theoretical our um, research tools. We, we highly recommend Dr. Sarah McDougall's book, Research Methods in Africana Studies. Um, it has been an instrumental tool that we use in our classes, um, especially our research methods classes. 
Um, it gives students the grounding from a disciplinary approach on how to apply the appropriate methods and ideologies uh, and theoretical frameworks to study Africana people's um, realities. So in terms to, to accomplish the task of documenting what we do in Black studies, uh, we took a case study looking at uh, two departments. And so the first I'll, I'll, I'll focus on is which Cal State Dominguez Hills. And the mantra for uh, Cal State Dominguez Hills is a place where uh, scholars, thinkers, learners, and learners are nurtured. Um, and essentially what Afri uh, Africana studies at Cal State Dominguez Hills, what it seeks to do is to put students in a position to cultivate their intellectual, uh, their, their intellect, but also their critical consciousness. And so in many of the courses, what we attempt to do is to nurture critical thinking, uh, cultivate the leadership skills and engage students with intense learning and uh, uh, publication opportunities. Um, and so in terms of the approach for the article, uh, essentially what we did is we assessed Africana Studies courses and we sought to identify how many high impact practices were utilized by faculty members teaching those courses. Um, what came back is that the overwhelming majority of our courses implemented some form of high impact practices. Right? Um, of the 17 courses assessed at that time, uh, 10 of them used seven or more high impact practices to engage the students. Um, all of them used at least five high impact practices. So essentially what we concluded uh, within our department is that high impact practices is a large cornerstone of what we do. And so what does that look like um, in regards to classroom instruction? In many cases, um, all of our faculty members in terms of the courses that were assessed, um, utilize high intense uh, writing activities to make sure that students are developing and cultivating their writing skills to be able to articulate themselves. Well, first uh, assess and identify the topic in which they're speaking about, but also the ability to articulate their analysis clearly uh, to convey the central points in regards to the subject matter itself. The next uh, high impact practices that were largely uh, infused was having a global perspective. And I know for most Africana studies departments, they take on a global uh, perspective. Um, and it's the same here at uh, Cal State Dominguez Hills where we take a Pan-African ideological approach uh, where we are introducing students to communities across the globe, uh, whether that be in the US, Europe, Africa, uh, the Caribbean, so on and so forth. So we're expanding students' knowledge base and introducing them to uh, customs, traditions, and uh, other things that are happening in our Africana communities. And we're identifying the linkages of, of consistencies of what's happening there versus what's happening here. Um, ultimately, these practices have been very effective in terms of developing students. Um, in many cases, we have a large number of students that have uh, presented at, at uh, NCBS conference. Um, this tradition was established over 20 years ago uh, by Dr. William A. Little. And this tradition has been continued and advanced under the leadership of Dr. Uh, Menashe Furusa. These are the two uh, instrumental faculty members that established many of the traditions that we carry out here in Africana studies, but it's been carried out for an extended period of time. So over the course of 20 years, we have uh, a large number of students who have uh, presented at uh, professional conferences. And this is original research that they have presented, most of which have uh, presented at uh, NCBS, the National Council for Black Studies, as well as ASCAC um, in terms of their research. Um, and, and, uh, and also uh, this has been consistent and we have roughly about five to 10 students that continue to present annually. And so it happens consistently every year. The other aspect in terms of, uh, as an indicator to show the effectiveness of the teaching models, we have a large uh, percentage of students that actually transcend uh, into graduate school as well. Um, and there have been activity, extracurricular activities that help to prepare, prepare them for graduate school, but also the application process. And so with this aspect, what we have been able to do is to identify techniques in the classroom, but we also see the reward outside the classroom, looking at a high rate in terms of students presenting at, at, at professional conferences, 
publishing papers within uh, some of the leading journals in our discipline, as well as uh, going on to further their education uh, and uh, graduate programs as well. And so student research engagement and publications is one of those major um, high impact practices that you can see the um, fruits of your um, investment in the students take shape, especially when you empower them to um, take on the role as um, the leaders in putting forth these types of um, engagement opportunities. And so um, at CSUN, we have developed a, um, a tradition of supporting students through their um, academic enrichment and research engagement through, for instance, uh, Dr. Hackett's men and the oftentimes slash women of color student research um, symposium as an illustration where students get to work collectively on a on large research project and present their research to the academic community um, on posters as an illustration um, that happens biannually. As an illustration, um, we also have opportunities where we've created the Afrocentric Student Research Conference, where students in both those conferences as an illustration, um, they are the ones who come up with the themes of the conference, they select their keynote speakers, they select the graphic art design, um, they oftentimes are the artists as well. Um, they're the ones who are the ones reviewing abstracts as an illustration. Um, and so those are, are really good opportunities to engage the, the students on um, the locally at your own school. And so we were training them, um, the students to conduct culturally relevant research. You also wanna train them to be able to, to actually disseminate that research. And so that's the second part of the publication, right? Putting forth an actual printed form as well as the oral presentations. And so we wanna train them to conduct that culturally relevant research. Um, you wanna ground them in the theoretical frameworks that are, um, are that are used in our discipline, but you also want to expose them to those faulty paradigms and frameworks that are used to assess people of African descent so that they have a critical consciousness towards them as they read other literature, the previous body of literature that's um, primarily um, has been out there, has um, grossly misrepresented Africana people, their experiences, their worldview, their realities, um, and their cultures, right? And as a result of that, we need students to be able to um, dissect that material, see the flaws in that, and be able to call it out so they don't erroneously use that and reference those things. Um, for instance, we oftentimes hear a lot of um, research surrounding African-American men and fatherhood, um, and that students read and reference saying that Black men are absentee fathers when they need to critically analyze the lens that's used to assess that. And if you, you interrogate that, you see that there's a white um, normative cultural framework that's used that applies the white male's role in his family and with parenting um, to assess the black male. And that's a faulty paradigm. And so students are equipped then with the, the methodological um, knowledge to be able to critique those types of frameworks and then look more to research that use a more appropriate um, lens um, of Africana studies. And as a result of that, they're able to find, um, find a very um, different research results as an illustration, but they also are able to then uh, find research that points more to uh, the, the unique roles, like the research that shows that African-American males have the highest level of parental involvement than any other racial group of men as an illustration. And so those types of things are important for students to be able to have in terms of that critical consciousness, they need the culturally relevant research skills. And as a result of that, they can produce, we can produce more effective and well-prepared social engineers. When they can both critique pre-existing literature, they can critique other people's arguments, they can critique legislation as an illustration, right? And they can also then develop um, that, that same legislation. They can develop um, arguments, they can develop um, pub their own publications and, and so on and so forth. So, and that's how they become well-prepared um, and well-trained social engineers. And ultimately our job is to empower students to lead the discourse on issues that matter to them. We don't necessarily wanna spoon feed students topics and say, oh, you should study this. Instead, um, students should be empowered to um, choose topics that are important to them because when it's important to them, they have a, a possess possessive investment in those topics. They will um, dive more into them. So with the, the, the three um, images here, there are um, Afrocentric Student Research um, Conference, as well as our, our student um, Afrocentric Student Review Journal. Um, and as a result of that, the students choose the themes and they choose what topics they want to research. And our job as educators is to aid them in that, um, that exploratory research process, aid them in uh, preparing their protocols for IRB, support them in their um, in their data collection, but, uh, but mainly is to, to give them the skills and the tools to be able to collect that data, to understand that data, to dissect that data, 
Um, and so what we've been doing is been, as a result of that, we've been able to take students for several years um, and it's been happening since before I even joined there 10 years ago at TSUN. But we've been able to take students to um, NCBS and they present their research. Um, we've been increasing our volume of students who participate um, as well. And so as a result of that, we get to see um, students' investment in um, the discipline, their commitment to the discipline grows, their commitment to um, transforming their communities grow as well. Um, so where do we go from here? The future of academic excellence in Africana studies must start with the discipline um, and it must, the discipline must continue to ignite an intellectual revolt that seeks truth and um, that seeks to empower students. Uh, we also recommend that it's essential to sustain student involvement in terms of shaping the future of the discipline. Since uh, students was very central in terms of establishing the discipline, they also should be central in terms of uh, cultivating what happens in our departments. And finally, academic excellence will be the result of our investment in Black studies and our students. So when we talk about the future, the future is dependent upon what we do in the classroom now, what we do with our scholarships, and how we nurture and support our students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gamage and Dr. Gamage. Um, <clears throat> I just want to go ahead and start try to time myself there. Um, so what was presented, I mean, very, very in-depth and very focused. I think that what that what I'm going to present is going to be far more broad and surface, uh, scratching the surface, I think, of overview of some key concerns for the future of Africana studies, Pan-African studies. And um, I'll go ahead and get started. I wanna talk about future study in Africana studies, considerations for the future, because as, uh, Dr. Gamish and Dr. Gamish discussed our objective, a part of our objective is to equip students with the skills that they need to become social change agents on behalf of people of African descent. Those things to some degree will, will uh, to some degree will shift the tools needed based on the conditions of the future. So future study, I, I believe is in, implicit is an implicit feature of the discipline of Africana studies. And it's a tool for helping us to plan the best ways to equip students with the with the professional uh, and community tools that they need. However, it's not always possible. It's not a it's not realistic to expect a discipline to be able to predict the future. And I don't think that future study in Africana studies should be based on prediction per se, uh, and particularly based on predicting a single future. There's likely um, multiple unfixed futures to consider, but what Africana studies can do is consider the future conditions that are possible and probable. And so the purpose of this investigation is to discuss what probable futures, future challenges will Africana studies be confronted with and by what means can these challenges be used to help the discipline continue to fulfill this purpose. So Africana studies flies under the radar and has um, for a long time those with strategic interest in it, of course, have always paid close attention to it from uh, in the Black community itself, scholars, and including uh, the State Department, of course. So the discipline has um, shaped higher education in general. It's expanded its institutional presence. Uh, it consistently influences students' sense of themselves, their racial identity, 
it influences their progress, increases or enhances their progress toward graduation. Yet it has been subject to many critiques and sometimes it's been subject to, to multiple and conflicting critiques. Some critique the discipline for focusing too much on scholarship and publication and not enough on community involvement. Yet at the very same time, the opposite critique is levied that it pays too much attention to community and activism and not enough attention to scholarship. And yet, and still the discipline has remained, has, has continued to um, advance. However, not enough people are aware of it. And when I say not enough people, not enough um, people, not enough people of African descent are familiar with the impact. So it's important for um, the discipline to make the general public of people of African descent more aware of this impact. And doing so will help to increase public support uh, among people of African descent for the discipline when it does come under attack, for example. When it comes to concerns that people have about the discipline in the discipline and in community and among the founders of the discipline, one of the chief concerns is that the discipline might uh, must make sure that it doesn't lose its commitment to social responsibility, its commitment, or in the words of Dr. Pellerin, this obligation to liberate the masses of people of African descent. It can be argued that the ultimate test of the discipline's relevance and validity and efficacy is the quality of its contributions to resolving the challenges faced uh, by people of African descent. And I think that there are several ways that the discipline can uh, ensure that it doesn't abandon this particular aspect of its mission. And one is to ensure that that pedagogy involves training scholars with the necessary knowledge and skills, commitment, not just to be interest, just to be interesting, not just to do presentations, not just to do scholarship, but necessary skills and knowledge necessary to advance their communities and to have departmental program, not just individual faculty involvement in communities, but department level community-based involvement. And also bridging the gap, the, the, the understanding, the conceptualization of scholarship and community. Uh, Dr. James Stewart talks about how it's important to merge the two scholarship and community by demanding that scholarship be involved in assessing and evaluating the needs of communities and evaluating the effectiveness of solutions to community-based challenges. And I think that these practical actions can produce a greater appreciation for understanding the discipline among the general public. Also, Africana studies is best positioned in my perspective to interpret the realities of people of African descent. It's uniquely positioned to articulate local and national agendas and needs to be the foremost voice. Uh, it, there are so many bodies that put out reports uh, on the, the needs and interest or the pathway forward for people of African descent, but the discipline that has, that dedicates itself to studying these issues oftentimes there's not enough of their voice. Um, the, we need platforms beyond academic journals and books that are more accessible. So it should be primary, the discipline should be primary and most reliable source of facts and knowledge about people of African descent. Needs to engage in policy. And Dr. Nathaniel Norman has always pushed that the discipline needs to be engaged in policy making recommendations and to use its, its specialization to do so, in which case it will need research institutions outside of the academic units on college campuses. It's important to have research institutes, institutions because we can't rely on mainstream public policy channels. And it's gonna be important for the discipline to develop its own institutions for research and public policy. In addition, uh, Dr. Dr. Nathaniel Norman also talks about the role of HB of Africana studies at HBCUs, that there are currently 101 HBCUs, but only a few departments 
of Black studies on those campuses. And according to him, the expansion of Africana studies at HBCUs would lead to greater acceptance and recognition of the discipline. But at the same time, Africana studies has the potential to help uh, to contribute to HBCU's success with moving students toward academic, in, enhancing their academic performance and connecting the ethnic and uh, the ethnic and scholarly identity together. Moreover, I think that the that the future of the discipline is often critiqued for needing to be more diasporic in scope. However, I appreciate those scholars who have pointed out that the discipline has always been international uh, in scope. Although at the same time, the African world, of course, that it focuses on is global and international in scope. But it's still critiqued in the sense that it, it needs to become more and more diasporic and it's, uh, or global in its analysis. And it's important, I think that uh, Rita Idozi and Glenn Chambers make, a, make the point that the study of Af any di African diasporic identity is made more valid by being related to the histories and the cultures of Africa and other African diasporic identities. This is gonna be uh, particularly important given that the demographic shifts that are taking place. Demographic changes in the US population are gonna have social consequences that increase before COVID-19 and social distancing, there's been an increase in travel from the African continent, from other African diasporic locations to the US and an increase in travel from the US to the African continent. And there's social consequences that come along with that. They, they, they're they likely to influence things from religious affiliation to racial politics and party affiliation. Um, and because of that, the discipline is going to need to continue to maintain and expand its international scope. There are also more Black people traveling to the African continent, increased demands for dual citizenship from African Americans in, on the African continent. And of course, again, these things are going to shape political attitudes among Black populations, and even the spiritual, everything from um, racial politics to the spiritual systems that Black people identify with uh, are shaped by their travel from different African diasporic locations around the world. With that, in addition to, to social media, increased migration uh, globally, all of those things are going to bring opportunities for international or, or cross ethnic interaction, racial interaction, and in between people of African descent. The role that Pan African Studies or Africana Studies can play is that it's the most capable in scope and epistemology to bring understanding and unity across the diverse African world. The curriculum in, in Africana studies brings about the awareness necessary to reduce the likelihood of conflict resulting from poor communication, uh, in accepting racist myths or differing beliefs and values between people of African descent as they come into contact with one another due to increased international travel. So it has the ability to prepare students to work interculturally in groups. Um, and especially among people of African descent. To expand that scope, it's important that the discipline elevate the teaching of African languages as a standard practice. Increased travel, again, is gonna to lead to increased opportunities for interaction between Africa and its diaspora. And languages can make these interactions more understanding, more appreciative, and increase opportunities for community building and Pan-African organizing. Second departments of African studies need to design and lead study abroad and student exchange programs on the African continent. Increasingly, uh, programs that take students to Africa are gonna help them gain better understanding of their curriculum um, and of African histories and cultures, increase their interest in working in Africa and taking opportunities and being prepared to do so on the African continent. But also, we are in the need for more ethnic specific theorization. This is something I think that Dr. Jawardena does, but ethnic specific theorization, it's important to have, yes, grand theories that, that, that are culturally, culturally specific, that speak to African people in general, but also 
um, specific theories dedicated to, to African ethnic uh, groups as well. Also, it's gonna be important for, the, for uh, the development of Africana studies in other countries. And those in the US and the UK can play a major role in, uh, in that process. As far as advancing Africana studies curriculum, I think it's important for the discipline to, con to continue to uh, to advance a scholarship in the area of Black queer studies and in, in the umbrella of Black sexuality studies in general and Black men and women's studies, STEM courses in the discipline from health, uh, economics courses, as well as religion and, um, and spirituality. It's important, it's going to be important for Africana studies to apply its perspective to the topics such as mixed race identities, especially again, given the changing demographics in the country as well. And if the discipline does not address these topics, then it will leave an opening for other disciplines who do not have our interest and are um, likely to address these topics in a historical and, and um, culturally inappropriate ways that will only sow division and alienate uh, Black people, Black populations from the discipline. As Dr. Jawardna has noted, the advent of 5G technology will is going to increase social uh, or distance learning. And on our campuses, that's going to put students of African descent in particular who are entering these digital spaces from uh, different knowledge bases and different access to uh, digital tools. So the advocacy for, uh, for digital tools on college campuses, Africana Studies faculty are gonna need to be in the lead of that kind of advocacy for increased student access to distance learning technology, as well as skills. There's an increased personal, personalization of uh, basic, needs, banking, uh, healthcare, et cetera, but to make sure that those are more accessible, that they're equitable um, and reliable and, and relevant to people of African descent is going to take uh, Black people who have those skills and digital skills need to be included into the, uh, the, the, school, the tool base in, the, in our departments. One of the things that Dr. Gamish and Dr. Nathaniel Norman have talked about before is the importance of K through 12. Those of you who are paying attention, you probably have heard of the advance in California for um, ethnic studies and K through 12. It's important for us to focus on developing curriculum and K through 12 curriculum. And I think that doing so is going to put those of us who teach in higher education, give us the opportunity to teach more specialized courses. With, uh, with the presence of Africana Studies curriculum in, K, in the K through 12 area. I do think that the, crown, that the most fundamental thing to look at in the future is gonna be our epistemology. The nucleus of Africana Studies is, epistemo is this epistemology and its integrity has to be kept at all costs. Before all political, economic and structural battles, the discipline has to fight this for its epistemology first and foremost. The loss of its epistemology is the only thing that could make it Africana studies in name only, or as uh, as uh, Dr. Carroll often says, uh, in blackface. So, the distinction may seem pedantic, but um, it's important. I think that there are. There's far more agreement uh, than disagreement among different perspectives. There's a lot of emphasis on perspectives and not having exclusive or monolithic perspectives in the discipline. But I think it's important now to look at the commonality that we share. Some say it's epistemology in the discipline should be grounded in the African worldview. 
Others use the language of African deep thought and others Afrocentricity, as you can hear even on this panel. Although each of these terms has a different meaning, especially to those of us who are steeped in Africana, we know the nuances and the differences between them, but they also share many traits. They all, for example, agree that to secure its future, the discipline must correctly locate, it, it, locate classical African civilization in order to have a proper chronology and knowledge base to draw on, that it must take, make use of African worldviews and cultures to understand the realities of people of African descent, and that it must be self-conscious, agentic, and liberatory. So now I think even though we have a very detailed understanding of the difference between our ep epistemological lenses, it's also important for us to look at what we agree on. I do think that one, main, uh, one important thing for us to pay attention to is the tyranny, what I'm calling the tyranny of equity. At, Equity, of course, an inclusion agenda is sprouting up all over the country, usually involves nurturing an environment where all members feel a sense of belonging, opportunity, and success. These race, race equity initiatives help the universities um, feel that they're living out their agenda, but we do know that history tells us in times of financial belt tightening, there's pressure to shed cause for racist, racial justice threats to cut Africana studies departments and programs to consolidate into ethnic studies departments. Um, so the logic of diversity is going to be used to attack race specific initiatives across campuses. Um, and this is something that Ibram Kendi calls egalitarian exclusion or limiting or prohibiting race specific initiatives using reverse discrimination as a justification. I believe that race and equity agenda is going to be used as a justification to say that race specific uh, initiatives need to be diluted. This is going to happen, I think, in the near future. And I do believe that this is where we will run into a problem using language such as multidisciplinary, multidisciplinarity to describe the discipline. Uh, I think that there's a strong chance that that same logic, that same nomenclature is going to be used to try to, to attempt to pressure departments to, um, to merge and to, uh, to dilute our departments, especially under the pressure of financial budgets and particularly as state funded institutions. So this is a major threat. The discipline is an existential threat in and of itself. I think it's important for us to pay it to, to keep that in mind and we can expect it to be viewed that way in the future because it produces a kind of consciousness, identity, appraisal, knowledge base, and uh, will that will be that's capable of upsetting the race, racial privilege hierarchy in this country. So it's going to be subject to attack. Wondering if I went over. One minute. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that um, notification. So I think that it's important for us to be expand our curriculum into general education, to seek departmental status, as Dr. Ricky Jones advocates, to collaborate with other disciplines, and uh, support race-specific initiatives across campuses whether they be living, Black living learning communities, Black student centers, and uh, Black faculty, staff, organizations to create campus-wide Black action plans. Hiring, I think our discipline is the, the greatest, the certification that we offer, the PhD, the masters are the, are the best measures of competence that we have. And now that we have a critical mass of PhDs across the country, it's going to be a major problem if our hiring processes do not demand that we hire people with PhD, PhDs in the discipline. Because when we hire people who are very intelligent and very skilled, but not knowledgeable of the discipline, the consequences are spread across the entire discipline. And the reason that I called this, uh, this presentation is the ship in the open sea is because Dr. John Henry Clark referred to uh, African people as a ship, the ship of state, and that the scholar 
his purpose is to prophesy where we still must go. And uh, I think aboard that ship of state, I think Africana studies is an essential navigation system that, um, that can tell as a people, people of African descent, what we still must do and what we still must be. Thank you very much. All right, everyone, thank you so much for those presentations. At this time, we will begin our Q&A uh, session of the panel. All right, so to, I'm trying to make sure I see everyone. Okay, so to Dr. Gamage, um, first, thank you for your presentation. As a former African-centered teacher at Joseph Little's and Guzo Saba Charter School, I would like to hear your thoughts of differences or specifics of ways to utilize the information you discussed in public, private, and our charter K through 12 schools. Is, is this different setting K through 12 versus a university setting? What suggestions would you give to secondary school teachers and our institutions when utilizing the African worldview, Afrocentric perspective, and other frameworks you, um, you discussed in your presentation? Um, so thank you for the question. Um, one of the things that we we like to emphasize is that Africana studies is not limited to um, higher education. Africana studies must start really um, in the womb, in our homes, right, um, and, and with our kids in K through 12. Otherwise, we are doing them a great disservice if they don't know who they are. We we have young children, um, and our children are in first and second grade. Um, and what we're finding is that it's important that they first know who they are right, in order for them to understand anything else in the curriculum or in the world. Um, and when they don't know that, then they're more susceptible to um, receiving information about other people as being great, as being the thinkers, the leaders of, of knowledge production, um, and that's problematic. Um, and so I think for the way that you translate those high impact practices into the K through 12 system has to start with once again, that grounding, right? Remember we talked about that student centeredness is grounding them in the histories, the culture, the worldview of Africana people. Um, so it always has to start there. And so as a result of that, um, instructors are for the K through 12, as well as higher education are responsible for incorporating that level of knowledge into every sector of their curriculum. Um, from the, the text that they select, um, from the, um, the images that they select to even put on the walls in their classroom, the images, uh, the books that they select for the students to read, um, from the, the stories that they tell, the holidays that they emphasize, um, this should be um, grounding them in who they are as Africana people first. And only thing that I would also add is that, you know, for K through 12 teachers, they go through uh, professional uh, development training and things such as that. And in those trainings, they should embed a process mm -hmm. to expand those teachers' knowledge base in terms mm -hmm. of representation, material, mm -hmm. uh, and content that they introduce to students. Um, with the plethora of different new apps that they have to introduce students to a wide range of different literature, uh, that part of that professional training is to challenge K through 12 teachers uh, to expand their own knowledge base. Mm -hmm. So uh, when they are put in a situation to introduce concepts, um, at minimum, they use concepts that represent, you know, the global population around the world. Um, I, I, you know, in terms of an African centered or Afrocentric approach, it would be lovely. <laughs> it would be lovely for them to, to have an African centered approach. Um, but, you know, for someone who's not grounded in our discipline, I'm, I'm not sure if that's a realistic expectation, right? And so I think that's why I say at the minimum to challenge them to uh, seek training and, and, and whether that's, if they wanna call that cultural sensitivity training and things such as that, but mm -hmm. that they should tap into uh, ethnic study scholars in terms of expanding their knowledge base and, and as well as concepts and, and tools that they use inside the classroom to introduce mm -hmm. uh, information to students. Well. And then part of the responsibility of the discipline is to provide that training and levels of certification, right? So the discipline can do that. We can offer through our programming, um, teaching certifications and where people are gaining that cultural competence to actually enter into the classroom. So that's a way that we grow and expand our discipline as well by aiding and supporting and really collaborating with the K through 12 uh, systems um, in our local um, environments as well so that um, there is a synergy between what we do in higher education and the preparation that the students receive in K through 12 so that they come there not knowing 
um, excuse me, more prepared to know who they are and how they enter into the space as opposed to having students entering and having never heard of um, historic figures outside of Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X as an illustration. We want them to have more grounding. And so part of the responsibility then of the of NCBS, of our discipline, of our departments and programs is to also provide that those levels of certification and training. And one last thing, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And make sure that our institutions support those things because that's an added thing that's on our plate. And so we have to understand that, that, that the, we have to have institutional support to be effective in that, in, in that endeavor. Um, and that means recognizing those type of activities in the RTP uh, process, but also providing resources um, to support and aid in, in disciplines and departments that, that are committed to that type of work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next question is for Dr. Carroll. When introducing students to African worldview cosmology, how do you engage students from the majority group who come with conservative values, but believe they have a diverse viewpoint? I, I, I had answered this in the chat, so I'll just uh, read what I posted in the chat. And I said, in most instances, I work on showing evidence for worldview differences within their daily lives. Rather than staying so philosophical, I point out the basic evidence found within the structure of a classroom, for example. Why is it assumed that all seats must be in rows? Why are faculty instructed to return seats to rows? How does the structure of rows versus circles reflect cultural worldview differences? Dealing with these basic day-to-day -day realities allows for majority students to rethink um, what they take for granted. So again, you know, the worldview framework Obviously, it's philosophical, but when you deal with on the ground stuff, the, the way that our students move through the world and you show the contradictions with things that pass as universal, as opposed to us understanding that there are cultural differences, it allows for those students to rethink. Doesn't mean that they're going to be convinced, but you have to find that day to day evidence. Um, and, and I've learned that that works. Thank you so much. And the next question is also directed to you from Dr. Livingston. Thank you for that great presentation. Do you have a rubric for assessing AWV consistent critical thinking? And answer that in the chat. And I said, I do not at this moment, but it's something that I need to be working on. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is for Dr. McDougall. How does Africana studies practitioners and departments protect themselves from being outsourced as diversity agents of the university rather than working to advance Africana studies for its own aims? Thank you for the, the question. I think that this is where like, um, this is where the departments can, and black faculty and staff can play a role, like having a, a black campus plan, because it's the, stu the students, faculty, and staff on campus. And uh, it's important for us not to wait for uh, initiatives to come down from the, um, from the president's office and from academic senate, but to develop our own assessment and say, this is what we need, and develop our own uh, assessments. So, if we do that, then we, we can enter those kind of university-based initiatives with the agenda already in hand. And um, we, can, we can start from there. But I think the problem sometimes is we so, it's difficult to ask to demand a place on Black faculty and staff because they're so already so overtaxed, but definitely to have our own plan so that we're not in a position where we're reacting and the rest of it i think is up is is dependent on the things that dr gamage and dr gamage mentioned like putting that kind of service and placing greater value on it in the rtp evaluation but actually in the written criteria um in an explicit measurable way like the how much that counts for promotion and as well as tenure but thank you for the question Thank you all so much. And our final question is for the Gamage family. Dr. Kirby says, infinite love and gratitude to all the presenters and attendees, um, attendees at this virtual gathering. 
I love the notion of a commitment to the well being of students, and I would like to see actual wellness courses in our Africana studies departments. My question is to the Gamish family Do you mind sharing your ideas on ways we can demonstrate the commitment to our students' well being? Thank you, uh, Dr. Kirby, for the question. Um, so you're absolutely correct. Courses on wellness are a great start, but also um, making sure that the university has the appropriate support resources. I like to think of us as kind of like the first responders. Oftentimes, we're the ones who first encounter and see and have the audacity to say something about when we notice things happening with our students. Oftentimes, we'll have students walk by and go from class to class and people see that they're struggling and no one will say anything. So we're oftentimes those first responders and we're not all trained to respond in the ways that students need. Um, and so this, we need to make sure that our universities are invested in providing an appropriate level of resources that are culturally competent, right, for our students so that we can feel comfortable, right, um, helping to um, get those students to those appropriate resources um, that are on campus. But internally, we need to have those safe spaces as well. Students, for instance, uh, oftentimes experience food insecurities, housing insecurities. And so making sure our, our universities have those support services like food pantries, emergency housing as an illustration, but also that we have those resources internally like having food available for our students in our, our departments as an illustration and our offices as another illustration. Um, and so addressing the, some of their basic human needs, right, um, is important, but also making sure that the institution have those support services as well. And I think on a, a, a basic level, as faculty members and, and, and departments as, as units uh, in our discipline, we recognize that many of our students feel isolated mm -hmm. and there's a sense of in, invisibility for our students. And so we have to, uh, we have to acknowledge, you know, their humanity. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's even beyond them being black in, in, in the United States, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think part of the wellness component that, that uh, I was referring to is acknowledging their humanity and understanding mm -hmm. that their experience is unique in, in the spaces that they're occupying at this moment. And at that level of, of invisibility, maybe even more, uh, more, uh, exacerbated on college campuses, opposed to being in the outside world, at least there you, you have your friends, your family, so on and so forth. You know, there are some cases where students are completely isolated. So in terms of that wellness, uh, acknowledging that in class, acknowledging that within the context and coming up with activities to make them reflect on those things. Because in many cases, they may uh, know that something is there, but not be able to identify exactly what it is and try to grapple with that with having, you know, without having the skills to, to, to you know, accurately locate those things. So um, part of that wellness is acknowledging, you know, them, acknowledging what they're physically going through at that moment, psychologically going through in that moment, and try to use the course content uh, as a tool to help them uh, recognize those things and address those things in the most appropriate way, along with, as, as Dr. Gamage stated, connecting them with resources that will help to uh, advance and, and, and enrich their experience and their development. And then finally, one of the things that we do and unconsciously do because it's who we are as a people is create a family environment, a communal space for students. Uh, we, we cannot let go of that because that's who we are. And so we can't fail in our responsibility to create that communal space for students, making them feel at home in our departments so that we, they, they feel like the, the teachers are invested in their well-being, invested in their education, invested in their success. And so by, so, in the same way that your parents or grandparents or aunts and uncles are invested in seeing you at, um, grow and reach your goals, we need to have that same level of investment that's demonstrated to students. Students should know that we care about our actions and everything that we do. We shouldn't ever have to tell them, oh, we care, right? They should know it based on our engagement with them and how we, um, we um, relate to them, right? How we relate to them in the classroom out and outside of the classroom. It shouldn't be a matter of classes ended, my office hours are over, reach me during those times only. We have to make sure that we are um, creating an inclusive, welcoming environment for our students. So thank you again for the question and thank you all for the opportunity to present to you today. And thank you all so much. At this time, we will not take any more questions, but should you have more questions, I just put my email into the chat please feel free to email me your question and I will make sure that all panelists receive them and they will respond. At this time, I would like to open the floor to our panel for any last words. 
Anybody? Well, it's been a wonderful fellowship of scholarship. I love it. Um, also, I did want to mention that Dr. Kevin Brooks at Michigan State, who is also a board member with NCBS, he does teach wellness classes there. So please feel free to reach out to him uh, to find out anything that he may be doing as you develop your own courses in wellness and include um, those conversations in your classrooms. Again, I would like to thank you for attending our session today. Please, please, please join us tonight as our Cato Fellows will host our first virtual poetry slam. Remember, I have said and preached that our students are the future, the skeleton. They are why we exist. So please, let's support them in all that they do. And that begins tonight at 630. Thank you all so much and see you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.